Welcome everyone. I'm Adiana Gurnita. I'm a rheumatologist in direct care for 2.5 years. And uh, today I have the pleasure to have here another rheumatologist, Dr. Tonya Baker. She's a graduate of American University of the Caribbean Medical School. She completed her internal medicine residency at University of Tennessee and she finished her fellowship in rheumatology at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Tonya is one of the um, rheumatologists that I have knew that stepped into direct care, and I think uh, she's going to give us a great opportunity to learn about her practice, her challenges today, and um, I'm very, very happy to have Tonya here. So welcome, Tonya. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited about sharing my journey so far. Um, I'm still relatively new to um, my practice, which I just started, opened up actually in January. Um, but I've been learning about direct specialty care over the last year. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to share. Excellent. So we'll start with a question. Where, where did you hear about direct care? So it started when I actually was a resident at the University of Tennessee. I knew that I wanted to go into rheumatology and two of the primary rheumatologists here in Knoxville, uh, they were trying to recruit me because they were wanting to retire. And so they actually um, somehow came to one of the resident dinners that we had and uh, they were talking to me and trying to essentially talk me into returning back to Knoxville to inherit their patient populations. Um, and in that discussion, we were talking about all of the changes that were occurring um, with healthcare, primarily the meaningful use and MIPS criteria and all of this stuff that was essentially taking our time away from the patient and uh, causing us and forcing us to spend more time on the computer. And it was at that time that Dr. Fred Wolf said to me, you really need to think about going to going into concierge medicine. You need to learn more about it because this is the only way we're going to get our time back with patients. And so he put that little bug in my ear at that point in time. And I had heard about it. And when I had asked about concierge medicine, you know, people were, you know, kind of balked at it and they're like, oh, well, you can't treat patients. And that's only cherry picking patients, the ones that can afford to see you. Um, and so I didn't actually revisit that discussion until a couple of years ago, actually. Um, when I graduated from fellowship in 2015, I joined Rheumatology Consultants and I inherited Dr. Wynn and Dr. Wolf's patients. Um, they had both been practicing rheumatology since 1970, and those patients were used to those practices dating back to 1970. And so their expectations of me were to spend the same amount of time that they used to get from these two retiring physicians who actually maintain that time with the patients. Um, and I valued that time. And at first, my time was available. I had um, plenty of time to get my notes done in clinic and still go home, see my children and do what I needed to do. But as my practice continued to grow, uh, I couldn't see my new patients back in a timely manner. I couldn't see patients that were flaring. There was just no availability for anything outside of what was on my schedule because my schedule was being overbooked in order to compensate for, you know, whatever billing costs or whatever else. And then it got to a point where um, I, I found myself and the practice kind of pushing me to, you know, do infusions and get patients on high risk medications so I could charge at a higher level and do all this stuff. And with that came more documentation to, you know, to support the higher billing. And so then I found myself spending, you know, the time between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. doing documentation just to support that higher charge. And I was like a hamster on a wheel. I would spend all of my time with the patient because that's what they were expecting and that's what they wanted. And I thought that they deserved that. But then I had to spend all of my other time documenting on my own time. And so the amount of time that I was spending in taking care of patients was just unreal. And I wasn't even getting paid for all of that time. 
And so I had started looking at how to get away from that. And I was talking to my attorney, actually, we were going over my contract. Um, and uh, she was the one that said, you need to look into direct care for two reasons. A, you have a non-compete in place. And so we could probably get out of that non-compete, allow you to still practice in Knox County if you go direct care, because you won't be competing with their commercially and Medicare insured patients. And B, you may find that you're going to be happier that way because you're just, you're not going to be required to do all of that documentation, all this other stuff. Because the attorney that I had, she only works with physicians. And so she actually got a hold of some of her clients and who are direct primary care providers. And they essentially took me under their wing. They invited me to their practice and spent hours just talking to me. And in that time, like one of the primary care, Dr. Mark McCall, he said, you would be amazed at how much prices get inflated whenever insurance is involved. And he said, for my practice, I have a contracted rate. I order a CBC for $3. I order a CMP for $2. It costs $5 to get these labs that when patients go to your practice, how much do they get charged? And so I looked into that and I was like, they're getting charged like at least 30 to $40 every single time they need a CBC and a CMP. Like 10 and times so, more. Usually it's 10 times more. Yeah. And but have so, you been aware as a, as a traditional physician, as a traditional practicing physician, have you been aware about any of the cost of your consultation, labs, medication, everything that you are doing? I knew what we were charging, but I thought that was standard. I that thought was that's because that's what it was. Like, that's how much it costs to run those labs. I didn't realize that the price of the labs was actually being set by the insurance companies and especially Medicare. Mm -hmm. And so, and then, you know, and then it gets inflated. And so when I started, you know, asking around, actually, well, let me go back one step. In this time, I was volunteering time at a, a local practice called Interfaith. It is a practice that just um, provides medical care to patients without insurance. And so when I worked there, I started asking them questions. How much does it cost you to run these labs through the university? And they're like, like $5. So they gave me the same answer as Mark, Dr. Mark McCall. And I was like, well, then why are we charging patients in my office $30 for these labs, knowing that a good majority of my patients have high deductibles and, uh, you know, like they would have to meet those high. So they're paying all of this out of pocket, not realizing it could be so much cheaper. Um, and that's, that was my wake up call. Uh, so then I started asking more and more questions like medications. So Dr. Mark McCall was like, I can order this medicine at this price. And then we looked it up on GoodRx and the prices he was able to get medications were like, cheaper. like half the cost. Of course. And so I thought to myself, how much time do, do my medical assistants spend on the phone trying to get prior authorizations for these medications that cost like $3 if we don't try to send it to <laughs> insurance to get paid for? And I just thought, I mean, all of the prices go exponentially up when insurance was involved with anything. Um, and I just realized like, okay, I'm having to pay my medical assistant to sit on the phone for 40 minutes arguing a prior off for prednisone, for goodness sakes. Correct. I can get that for just almost $2. Nothing. Yes. And I thought to myself, like, this is absurd. This is why healthcare costs are so high. So I still wasn't convinced. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to get out. So when I started looking at um, companies that would uh, come in and do my billing for me, this was the biggest mind blower for me to hire a company to come in and do my insurance billing in my new private practice. It was going to cost like $14,000. And I thought to hire somebody to do my billing, <laughs> it's going to like, I'm going to have to see like 40 patients in a day to pay Correct. my billers. <laughs> this is like, yes, to pay everybody, but not you. Yes. And I was, this is insane. And you, they, and the reason why is because it's a headache to do the billing because 
insurance will often sit on it, deny it for so many reasons. And so you're paying these people to just keep submitting something that should have been paid for to begin with. And, and it's just a big game. And I thought I'm out. I, I just, I can't do this. I can't keep practicing in this private practice. Pushing infusions is what they wanted me to do. And I didn't always feel good about that. Cause I'm like, these are middle-class people who still work. Can't always take time off to get infusions. You know, I just didn't feel good about myself and knowing that I could probably provide for a good percent of the patient population at a significantly reduced price was totally the way that I wanted to go. And so uh, I finally turned in my 90 day notice and they all looked at me like I was cuckoo cachoo. They were like, you got is not going to survive. That's not going to work. And I'm like, you have no idea. You have no idea how much this is costing patients out of pocket. And so the cool thing was when I finally got out, got started in January, my patients, a lot of them followed me and some of them called and said, I don't know if I can afford to come see you. And I said to one of them, I said, I want you to sit down. I want you to calculate how much you pay rheumatology consultants for all of your, your visits, for all of your co-pays, for all of your lab bills, every for your medications. Sure. And I want you to tell me how much you pay in one year to them. And then I want you to, I can tell you how much I will charge you for the same thing. So she got up to September and found that if she continued to uh, follow me and not go to rheumatology consultant by September, she would have saved $1,500 in yeah. buying her medications through me in paying for the membership and then getting her labs through me, $1,500. And I thought, yes. I can provide for way more patients and not push the biologics. Mm -hmm. I, I like biologics. I love biologics of and they're appropriate sometimes, but you know, I still follow guidelines. I still start with methotrexate. I still, and a lot of times I can get them under control with that. And so I can provide for a lot more patients, cut the healthcare costs down and, and be satisfied and go home with a, just a good feeling. Clear about consciousness. Yeah. It's a clear consciousness. So I'm going to start you some questions with some questions. Um, it's very interesting to hear your story because this story, I think it's the story of all of us. Um, and somehow all of us, we relate to this story. We all got into medicine with a clear idea that we want to do good. We want to practice medicine. And we ended up being clerks, not doctors. And um, that relates to most of us. Now, you decided to go into direct care. Um, can you give us like a, a small snapshot about, let's say, five steps that you had to take to go into direct care? So, oh gosh, the first thing um, that I needed to do, and, no, and you know, not a lot of people tell you this, and I just knew this because actually one of the drug reps' mother, her job is getting physicians' practices started. And so she said, the first thing you have to do is find where you're going to practice. You have to find a place because that's going to be your address and your sentinel point for everything. Yes. Uh, in order to opt out of Medicare, you have to have an address. There's so many things and you can't use your home address. So the first thing I had to do was find a place. The second thing that I had to do was determine what, what I was going to do, fee for service, membership based. And so I sat down and I did a bunch of calculating. I knew that when I was at rheumatology consultants and I had a panel of over a thousand patients there, which was a little ridiculous. <laughs> um, I knew that I kind of wanted to cap myself at 400 to 500 patients. I knew that for rheumatology, I would want my patients to see me frequently and to encourage them to see me frequently. So to incentivize a membership over a fee for service type payment. Um, and so I just sat down, I did calculating. I said, this is how much money I want to make in a year. And so then I just went backwards from how much money I want to make in a year to, you know, minusing what I expect to pay for staff. I've only got one person working for me um, and came up with a magic number of, I'm going to have 400 patients. I could juggle that easily, still have time throughout my day to see sick visits, same day sick visits. Um, and, and then this is how much I'm going to charge. And, and the charging 
was very controversial. I'll tell you, my, my rates are pretty low and I did that for a number of reasons. I wanted to be able to still provide for my interfaith patients. Um, I found that when I worked at interfaith, patients were just very non-compliant. And part of that was because they weren't responsible, financially responsible for any of their care. And so I wanted to be able to offer something that they could afford, as well as a lot of my other patients, including my Medicare patients who are on a set income. So that's how I work is I just calculated it backwards, number of patients, how much money I wanted to make in a year. And I came up with a magic number of $80 a month membership in the beginning um, for general rheumatology care. And then I have a higher package um, that's $100. That was in the beginning, $100 a month membership uh, that would allow for 45 minute visits. Um, the membership would encourage patients to, I mean, the, the things that would encourage patients to sign up to the membership is that, you know, their labs were included. I thought that's super easy. I can say your labs are included. It cost me five bucks. It's nothing. Um, same day sick visits, if need be, they have 24 seven access to me. I have um, a personal cell phone as my business number. And so they can call me and they love being able to just text me something and they don't have to sit and play phone tag with my medical assistant. Um, and uh, so and the, then, first, you know, the first step was location, right? The location. Second step you and then I had to figure out, yeah. The my price, pricing. how are you going to price yourself? The third step? The third was how am I going to A, notify my patients and B, how am I going to market myself? So marketing. Um, Good. Marketing. Uh, how am I going to get my name out there? How am I going to get direct care language out there? Because I'm, most patients say, oh, she's cash pay. We can't afford that. They don't even like think, they don't even think it through. They just say, I can't afford cash pay. I'm already paying $300 a month in premium. I can't afford that. Um, and so I actually, what I did was when I was in my practice, uh, I wasn't allowed to solicit the patients, but if they asked me questions, I could answer them fully. And so that's when I just started saying, hey, when I go into this, I'm going to, you're going to have all my time and you're going to have all of my attention at that time. You're going to have the ability to see me if something happens that day or after our care. And I will not let you down. So the difficulty was when I was at Rheumatology Consultants, if I was busy or my schedule was busy, they couldn't see me. They, they'd have to wait weeks or go to their primary care and their primary care was like, I don't know what's going on, give them steroids. And so they were back to point A. And then by the time they got to see me, they're like, I really don't remember. And so I had to figure out a way to, sorry, my husband and one of my patients is texting me, um, how to market myself. And so one of my um, mentors, his name is Mark Adams. He's actually a naturopath in Seattle at this point. And he said organic growth. So as a, a woman um, and, at, and, and a rheumatologist, we tend to really listen to our patients and we tend to live life with our patients. And so that rapport with the patient is gonna sell you your direct care service. And so patients are gonna to want to maintain that. And so when I was able to say, hey, you are gonna have me 100% when you get out, if you follow me, then what happened is once they got out and they saw my practice and they were able to like easily get a hold of me, they started selling my name better than I could sell myself. Excellent, so, so that was another step. The organic growth. Organic growth. Um, now somebody is asking, how did you decide on the location of your practice? So I had to consider a, the last practice that I just left. Um, but also I wanted to make sure I was in a location that would be easily accessible to areas that I was already getting my patients from. So in Knoxville, we're, I mean, we're pretty close to other cities that patients are often driving from, and it's still like a 30 to 45 minute drive. And so I chose um, an area that was going to be further west of where I was working, much further away from downtown Knoxville, which is where everybody hates to drive. Um, and honestly, it came down to price. So when I was originally looking at my budget, I knew that I could only afford, you know, so many square feet and, and 
you know, in leasing, I found out it's all, you know, based on square foot. And so most places here in Knoxville is like $18 per square foot per month, essentially. Did you and buy or did you rent? I'm renting. Mm -hmm. I'm renting. Okay. And so I was trying to find an area of Knoxville that was conducive to anybody traveling around in this location, easily accessible, and I could afford. So lower budget. That was somewhat nice. And I stumbled upon this one. Um, the pricing was lower because this guy that I'm leasing from did not um, advertise or market with any of the realtors. He did it on his own. So he was naturally able to give a lower price. So that's what I did. I was looking on Craigslist or whatever else to find my location. And I drove around. So to find it. And that's how I was able to get my location. Is, the, is this all set up as a medical office or was it adjusted to become a medical office? It actually was a daycare mm -hmm. that, um, I love it. I'll tell you the truth. I have adjusted it and I've put in some sinks myself. Um, so it was not a medical office. And honestly, if you walked in here, you would think you were walking into somebody's home. Um, but it was not a medical office. So I thought, kind of, I looked outside of the box as to what I wanted. I wanted something that would just have three rooms. I needed an office. I needed two patient rooms, maybe a lobby. Um, and so that's exactly what I got. Sure. For how long have you lived in Knoxville? I have lived in, so I lived in Knoxville from 2009 until 2013. I was gone for two years for fellowship and I moved back in 2015. So I've been here since 2015 oh. until now. So you had some time to build up some relationship with other primary care physicians. Yes. That they know about you and the type of care that you provide. Um, we all have challenges when we start. What do you think was the biggest challenge for you besides figuring out pricing? Because that's, I think that's most of us, we have a, we have a problem with that. We don't know how to set up a price and we are afraid to ask for money for our services because we think we, you know, patients will not pay for that. Right. And then uh, we have a problem of setting up the bar too low. And then patients, they have this misconception that they, you know, they're going to get something cheap and not worthy. What, are, what was your challenge? Honestly, my challenge... And, and, and it's ongoing challenge. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier is trying to find the right software or what the, you know, whatever I'm gonna use for billing. Um, I was originally using Atlas as my electronic health record and in rheumatology, it does not work. Uh, I think it is great for primary care, but in rheumatology for prior authorizations, we need, I needed more information. And so Athena is what we ended up switching over to. And the billing through Athena has been difficult because I am a guinea pig to their newer membership billing. Um, and it is still tricky to this day. Um, and then just trying to figure out how I'm gonna keep inventory of the medications that I'm buying and, and keep track of all that. That's been probably the hardest thing. How am I going to get paid? Like where, where does that go and how do I get paid is, is the question. What medications are you buying as a rheumatology? Do you buy medication only for rheumatology or for primary care as well? I bought both. So I bought mostly the oral DMARDs, um, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, leflunamide, any of the oral NSAIDs, um, Salcept, you name it, Plaquenil. Um, and then I also provide primary care to my rheumatology patients at an additional price. And so the basic, uh, you know, primary care stuff, metformin, lisinopril, amlodipine, that kind of stuff. I also buy that for my patients. Great. And uh, you are able to offer that to the members of your practice. You don't offer right. it otherwise. Good. Right. Um, now, I'll ask the people that are here with us if they want to jump on the call and ask their questions. So somebody is asking, do you need a license to dispense medication? I mean, different states, they have different rules and you have to check with your state. That's essential. If you are allowed as a physician to uh, buy and sell medications. Uh, and I think some states, 
they do require a license. Uh, tell me the situation in your state. In our state, you do not have to have a license to dispense. Mm -hmm. So. So I buy medications because uh, when patients are, you know, stretched financially, I can buy medications and sell them to the patient pretty much at cost. I just, you know, add a dollar or so to it to save the patient uh, money, essentially. So I can buy medications much cheaper than what you can find on GoodRx, which usually has the lowest prices around. Give us an example, because probably most of the people that are here, if they are in traditional care, they don't know the difference. So leflunamide. Um, mm -hmm. Most of my patients who are on leflunamide for a 20 milligram tab, say I want to, they want to take, we'll just do 30 days, 20 milligram tab. It'll usually cost them usually 60 to $80 a month for a leflunamide. Um, insurance will sometimes pay that, sometimes not pay it fully. If they have really good insurance, they'll just have a copay for their meds. But in general, my, a lot of my patients have high deductibles. And so I can buy lifunamide for less than $30 for a 90 day supply. Just to give That's an amazing answer. price because, yeah. uh, from my patients, I know that they pay about $85 with insurance. Oh yeah. So it's, it's high. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And those are, yeah, it's just totally pricey. And Celebrex, that's another one, or Celecoxib, even the generic is expensive. And I can usually buy that for like $20 for a 90 day supply, not even 20. I want to say maybe 10 or 15. My medical assistant would know all this. <laughs> sure. How about biologics and infusions? Do you have any, I mean, what's your What's your thought about buying biologics and, or, you know, starting infusions in your office? I mean, that's the most common questions that I get from other rheumatologists. How do you do this? So the biologics, I obviously cannot afford. Uh, I get a lot of samples and I utilize my samples for new starts and then patients who can afford it. Um, and so I am... I'm not in cahoots, but I, most of the drug reps know me and know that I provide, was providing free care to interfaith patients. And so they usually give me a lot of samples. Granted that goes on to the, you know, people can follow that. Um, but that's how I do that. As far as infusions, I yeah. cannot do infusions, mm -hmm. but I was told at one point in time that if I got an NPI number under rheumatologics and not under my provider number, that I could be able to infuse biologics. Um, and I haven't even passed that yet because you would have to make sure that you have enough, you know, money to cover the biologic. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully, you know, the insurance company. Otherwise, honestly, what I've started doing is there are companies here that will actually do the pre-authorization process and get the patients the medications they need, whether it's an injectable or it's an infusable. And that saves us time <laughs> and therefore ends up saving us money, honestly. And a lot of times it, it takes the headache work out of it for us. Um, and so we don't do infusions here and biologic infusions. I plan to do nutritional IV nutrition. I can't hear you dear. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, so I plan to do IV nutrition for patients. I have a lot of bariatric surgery patients um, and they have malabsorption problems and we always end up with issues with that. So um, I actually do have two infusion chairs that were, that were pretty much grandfathered to me. Um, and we thought about doing you know, some IV hydration, IV nutrition therapies uh, as we grow bigger eventually. But um, I still provide you know, biologics, and I still write for them. I haven't slowed down on that. Um, Janice County's inhibitors, I have a ton of that, a lot of that, but I like those too, so. Where do you buy your medication from? And uh, meds. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have several different accounts through different, um, oh, not manufacturers, but uh, companies that will actually, you know, you can buy your medications from. I love Anda because I don't get, I don't get, you know, charged a whopping fee for um, shipping and they'll actually overnight it for free. If I have a certain order above a certain price, they over, so I don't have to pay a shipping cost. So that I just transfer all of that savings to the patient. 
Um, and I get it overnight. So a patient will usually call me and say, hey, I'm going to run out of Celebrex in about a week. I can order it and it's here the next day. It's no problem. Excellent. How do you sell your practice to a new patient that calls? You know, they pick up, you pick up the phone or your assistant picks up the phone. What do you tell the patients to convince them? You know, they are new patients. They don't know you. They um, never heard about direct care. And they kind of start the conversation with, do you take my insurance? I, so this has been a trial and error for us. Um, you know, in the beginning, you don't even know how to sell yourself. Um, but I learned that, you know, if I, A, if I answer the, the phone myself, um, the response that I get from them is a little bit intrigued by them because they're like, oh, the provider's answering the phone. This might be interesting. And so then I can say, well, we just do something a little different. Um, we are able to provide, you know, direct care without your insurance and, my package, I have a new patient package um, that, and the way that I sell it is I say $300 for the new patient package. And that's actually pretty darn cheap in, for most specialists. But I say that covers your first three months. And you'll, by the end of your first three months, you can then determine whether or not you go back to your primary or you can come to me. And I found that you know, it would be like me, you know, having a new patient package for $300 and then being able to give phone consults or whatever <laughs> and getting to the conclusion where, you know, and then not really technically being paid for all those phone consults, but in my eyes, I'm selling it as you get your first three months of care for $300. Um, and that includes, you know, your telling lab review and all this review and starting you on a medicine. And then if you decide that you like me, you can choose to stay in a membership. I mean, if you don't like me, you can go back to your primary care and they can continue monitoring you as well. Um, all of them have chosen to stay, all of them. I've not had one new patient choose not to stay as a member. Um, so it, it kind of sells itself. It's, I, uh, I think as I start talking to the patient and telling them, hey, listen, uh, let me tell you the other rheumatology places in town, but I'm going to give you a heads up right now. Their wait list is six months to a year. So if you find that your needs are sooner than that, I'm available. I probably have a new patient available spot in three weeks or something like compared to six months. So that's great. Uh, that's great. Yeah. You have to tell them your advantage because otherwise they will not read on your website or they will get, you know, they, they will get, to that point that where you say you don't take insurance and pass to that, they basically freeze and um, they will not read about the advantages. And it's very important for these people that are here to understand that you sell your practice and there is no one better than you to sell the practice. I think all of us, we've done it in the beginning and then we pass the, the I would say, the whole pamphlet that we constructed to our assistants, but you have to start selling your practice as a physician and patients do appreciate when a physician picks up the call. It's a little bit weird. Most of them are surprised that they will find a physician, but actually it's more convincing and you show that you are available and you want to do work for them just by basically providing this kind of uh, answers to their questions. So let me see um, if there is another question here. The other thing I was gonna add is usually when they call, you know, they're reluctant to spend any sort of cash money if they don't know if you can help them. So I'll say, give me a little blurb of what's going on and I'll let you know whether or not I think I can help you. And usually I'm like, I think I can help you. <laughs> so sure. then they sign up, it's no big deal. It, it ends up kind of selling itself. So. Sure, Dr. Kaufman was telling us last week about her 15 minutes meet and greet with the patients. And um, I've done that also in the beginning. I think they're very, very valuable because patients are very reluctant on paying cash for something that they don't understand and they don't see the value. I mean, they have the experience with the traditional system where they already paid but nothing happened and they are passed around. And then you show up after, you know, their trials and you say that you're going to do things, but you ask for 
a cash price. And um, you just have to give them something, make them understand that you are there in a different way and you are available, but you also have to be paid for your work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important for them to see that you connect with them and just giving them 10, 15 minutes from your time it sells your practice much better than just putting information on a website. Mm -hmm. Because as I, I can tell you, after this years of practicing direct care, I would say 80% of patients do not read the website. They find you, but they don't read the website. How do you market your practice besides, I mean, do you do anything outside of the organic growth that you already explained to us? Yeah, so I have actually utilized Facebook um, mm -hmm. and then I paid for some Facebook ads and then I also have Google and I paid for some Google ads. Um, I've created a Twitter account. I've created a LinkedIn account. I've created some other accounts that actually Becky Lynn um, Coffin was you know, encouraging me to do. I just haven't had the time to invest in that. And my, you know, I, and on, I don't, I just, I, I'll tell you the truth. I've been growing quite well uh, on my own without having to pay somebody, you know, to invest time in all those things. So Facebook and Google have my two primary marketing places. So I just mute someone. Um, so I will ask you another question. Um, now, there are more and more of us. I think that's, that's a plus. And I found out about more people being interested in direct care. Do you think it's important for us to amplify our voices, become, you know, become a community of physicians that share the knowledge and help each other in an organic way? It's not like to profit on others. Because somebody just asked a question, do you think this concierge, you know, or whatever practices that they say they can uh, help you to become a concierge medicine practice. Do you think they are helpful in helping you? I have my opinion, but I'll ask you, uh, what's your opinion about that? Um, I actually, there were a couple of companies that sent me some information. I have no idea if they send it to everybody. Um, and when I had looked into it, it wasn't it wasn't going to be worth it. And I'll tell you, Dr. Mark McCall was the direct care provider that I first met with. And he said, don't underestimate your, your ability to run a business and to start a business. He said, you got through medical school, you jumped through all the hoops that you had to do for medical school, internship, residency, and fellowship. You can run a practice without paying somebody else to do it. How valuable is your time? And if you don't have any time at all to invest in something that is yours, then maybe hire somebody else. But he said, it's probably best if you invest your time into this, this thing that's going to be your infant, essentially. He said, what you put in is what you're going to get out. And so when a company comes in, and that's what he said, when a company comes in and does all this stuff for you, they're going to charge you a lot. Like They're, they're making money off of you uh, and starting a practice that you can, you're perfectly capable of doing. And so I think that as direct care, like I look to you, Deanna, uh, and I turn to you and ask you a ton of questions in the beginning, like, you know, what do you do? You, what kind of electronic health record? And, and I think that this is a great service, um, having these webinars and being able to ask these questions and kind of um, help each other out because there are going to be companies that can make money doing this. But honestly, you can save a whole lot more money and maybe get a paycheck a little bit sooner rather than later in doing something that we can all kind of help each other do. Um, and, and Mark McCall was exactly right. This is not, this is not, this is not rocket science. This is not something we can't do. It's just something that we're not used to doing and it's something that we're not trained to do. So using each other uh, and talking about how we can maybe better the process and make it a little bit more streamlined we won't need those companies, you know, it's just something else to raise the cost for things. So. Yes. We have to make these people understand the cost of that because I had no idea when I started and I was offered uh, to, I was offered this kind of help from a few companies and the starting price is 30 to 40 K and it goes very rapidly to 60 to 70 K depending on your needs or what's your projection of patients. 
So to kind of get down to earth and make those money to pay, unless you have the money aside, it's going to be a struggle. Um, and probably like you, I did not want you to take any money from my, you know, from my family. And I took my time to invest in those, um, you know, kind of aspects of every aspect of the business. Many people will ask me if I have a business background. I don't, <laughs> but I learn. And like you said, we are very smart to figure our way out. And just by challenging yourself with different aspects of the business, you're going to learn things that nobody will tell you and nobody will fix it for you. They will give you advice, but you still have to fix those problems. And for those of you that do not know, I started this Facebook group um, in about two years ago when I felt the need of connecting with other specialists because I knew about the direct primary care community and I saw a lot of things happening there. And I said, why can't we physicians, specialists cannot be united to help each other overcome the challenges of a specialist? Because most of us, we have this idea that we don't have a referral system behind us, so we cannot survive with that. And I can tell you from my experience, primary care physicians, I don't know about your community, but usually the traditional, uh, the traditional practices of primary care will not send you patients. Patients will find you and you will grow the practice organically by providing an excellent medical service to your patients. And then after I created this group, people started to show up there and we started to share information and help each other to, you know, to a level that I have not seen before because we are all busy. But every single time when people were having questions, somebody will come there and will answer the question. And then I went further and I started this Direct Specialty Care Alliance with the idea is to grow this uh, movement to the next level to educate physicians that they can be independent and especially specialists that they can be in, independent. And I have to tell you that in two years, we were able to do amazing things. Our voice is now nationally recognized. I'm going to present um, at um, the American Congress of Rheumatology in November. I'm going to talk about direct care in rheumatology. So I invite all of you there with the idea to learn and grow in this space. Um, it's not easy, but it can be done. And if we are more, it's better for all of us. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested, join us because it's going to, we're going to share more and more information. And that's what we are trying to do with these webinars. I mean, Tonya here, she has four kids. I have three kids. We are busy. We have our practices, but we give our time and efforts to grow this movement. And I think that's, that's amazing for, um, for our profession to, to give back to our colleagues. Now, um, let me see if other people are There's a raise. asking questions. So yes, I'm going to send you the website of, um, and the website is it's growing. Um, I'm going to amplify the voices of you there. I'm going to put the practices, um, the direct care practices there. I have a lot of discussions with companies that want to send us patients for cash. So I want to grow all of you in this space because we all deserve to be happy. We all deserve to provide medical care and patients need to learn about us. So if you are in direct care, if you don't have time, I even put a video together for patients to make them understand what is direct care. Copy that video, share it with your patients. I, I'm gonna have another video about um, direct care for physicians, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. I have to tell you that. And we all make these efforts, but if we are more, it's better for all of us because it's becoming easier for patients to learn about mm -hmm. the way that they can receive medical care. So um, let me see um, if there are other questions, but what is an advice um, 
Tonya, that you can give to these people that are considering direct care today? I mean, it honestly, it comes down to the fact that I am much happier where I'm at today. My patients are far happier than they, they were before when they were following me at rheumatology consultants. Um, it just, it, it feels good to be practicing medicine the way that we're supposed to be practicing medicine. Um, and, you know, Becky was saying the other day, you know, there, there, it's gonna, it's, it's a roller coaster of a ride. Uh, and, and, you know, most likely in the beginning, it's, it's far more ups and, <laughs> and downs, uh, steeper ups and, and, and much deeper downs. But uh, I, you know, my, my perception in the long run is that, um, A, I know that my patients, hopefully, I know that my patients are going to be seeing me. I'm going to have a paycheck every month because of the memberships. I can allow uh, time slot availability throughout my clinic during, during the day because I know that patients have already paid their monthly membership um, and, and, you know, vice versa. Patients understand that I'm going to be available for them as well. And so it is, it may not be as, I mean, if I put, if you just project how much I can make in a year. So, so I plan to have 400 patients at a hundred dollars a month. That's a good chunk of change. Um, and to know that I can still provide the care that I need hopefully in less amount of time, because I'm not having to do all the documentation required for insurance purposes. So that in and of itself saves me hours a day, like three to five hours a day is what I'm saving. And so my time is just as, uh, as, as important as everybody else's time and direct care allows, it just, you know, I, I think it allows you to have a good life and the patients are, are, you know, it's just, better for the patients. Um, I just, I can't speak well enough about, you know, the direct care. And, and honestly, I'll never go back to taking insurance again. It's just, it's less stress. <laughs> Do you have a patient story that you can share with us? Oh gosh. Um, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of patient stories. You know, the, the one patient that I had um, already explained, you know, she was going to be saving a lot of money just to see me, but I have several patients. So one of the um, other things, since I do have extra time, um, you know, and availability, I have um, some patients who are in the hospital or whatever, and I can do a telehealth visit with them at whatever time. Uh, and I don't have to spend like an hour driving to the hospital, seeing the patient just to talk to them. And the hospital that my one patient's at right now, I do still have um, accreditation at, but at the other hospitals, they they actually value me as a rheumatologist and they value my opinion and they value the fact that I care about my patients to know how they're doing and to give my input on their care about how they're doing. And so one patient, honestly, you know, she was told she had functional myopathy on a ventilator. I don't understand how that's even possible, but um, she ended up having a very atypical myasthenia gravis. The only way I would have um, been able to, to figure that out was to continue to be part of her care. And honestly, it didn't take much of my time. It took 45 minutes, some videos from the family, a few phone calls, and the patient is alive and, and getting off of the ventilator and doing really well. And so the possibilities for direct care is endless, and it all comes back down to patient care, honestly. Um, you're able to do so much more for the patient when you take all the nuisance and everything else out of the insurance and, and billing and whatever else. Excellent. Um, I think Martina wants to ask a question and then uh, Celine wants to ask a question. Yes, thank you so much for giving me uh, an opportunity to ask questions because I had more than one like follow up. So I hope that's okay. Thank you so much, uh, Tonya, for presenting. I am an admirer and you, Diana, too, you're my, I didn't know about Tonya until now, but both of you are such an inspiration. I'm in uh, Massachusetts and I don't have a non-compete clause. I want to start a DPS and I'm all upset about it and all nervous about, well, a couple of things. First of all, I don't even know, like, where do I start? Like, logist like you explain the logistics, but like legally, who do I talk to? Where do I register? Like, I have NPI, but how do I, like, let's say I find a space, what, like, what is the, actually the next step in terms of legally setting up my practice? And I had a follow-up question after that. 
Yeah. So, you know, the next, so if you've already got a space aligned, then, you know, it's just figuring out when are you going to stop seeing those patients and when are you going to start? And then in order to opt out of Medicare, that's the next question. Are you going to opt out or are you not going to opt out? Um, I opted out because Medicare rules the roost. I mean, they, 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 they drive everything. And so if you accept and participate in Medicare, you still have to follow all the documentation guidelines, whatever. Even if you don't take commercial insurance, you are still obligated to all of that. And if they were to audit you, you could be in a lot of trouble. Um, and you still have to follow all of the Medicare rules. I was telling Diana that um, one of the other things that just pushed me into direct care is that about six months before I left rheumatology consultants, I received a threatening letter from Medicare stating that if I continued to monitor and treat somebody's thyroid, I would be charged with a $25,000 fine for charging a primary or a specialty fee for a primary care service. $25,000 fee for treating somebody's pain with some thyroid medicine because it should have been primary care. Anyway, so first thing is your term is whether or not you're gonna accept Medicare. And then no. if you're not, then in order to opt out, you have to send a letter to the, and okay. you'll find all of this online. And I'm more than happy to help you. It, what, it's not as direct as everybody said. It was actually kind of complicated for me to find the right address. But, and you want to make sure they get it and make sure you're opted out. Because if something was to happen and you're not opted out and you see a patient and you charge a patient cash and Medicare finds out, you could be in a lot of trouble. Um, mm -hmm. so just following through to make sure that you were truly opted out and that comes in, in, um, quarterly, um, increments. So it's either January 1st, April, and like goes on and on and on. Um, we, and I'm going to ask you to maybe put this in a frame and we'll put it on the website for everybody, okay. because that's a constant question. Uh, when should you opt out and how, what is the process? Maybe we can put it like three, four steps, and then people will know which address. That will be easier for everyone. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it determines, you know, it's determined by where you live and, and, but there is a website for all where you looked out all that up. Okay. Um, and then, so that would be the next step. And then just figuring out like what your budget is, how much money do you plan to make and just kind of getting a, a business plan. So Atlas MD, they do have their electronic health record, but they are a, just a absorb amount of, of resources for like they have a um, template for business plans and, and everything else like that because then you have to come up with how much money is it going to cost to get me started like how much do I need this is my next question That's, yeah. like should I take a loan or like how how would you it, I don't it, have any capital I don't have any capital right now so I, I actually didn't take a loan but I knew that I was going to be getting a bonus at the end of December so I used my bonus as my startup. And then I put things on, this is going to sound absurd, but it's because I actually applied for a loan and the interest rate was going to be 8%. I was like, that's pretty crappy. So I got credit cards and then had 0% interest on my credit cards for two years. So that's what I did. To how did you, how did you do that? I'm sorry, maybe that's not appropriate, but how, like, I think the shortest time I was, able, the longest time I was able to get zero free interest was nine months. So can you share the credit cards you got? So, yeah. So, I mean, there are different credit cards um, or like some of them, I would actually transfer them. Like one, I only had like, you know, 0% interest for six months. And then I had a small transfer fee to another credit card for 0% okay. interest for two years. So I played the game of, and granted that's a lot, but what I did was I would, you know, use my credit card until I got maxed out. And then once it started charging interest, before it started charging interest, I would actually switch it over to a different credit card. Okay. Interest. Um, and, and then. How long did it take you to be profitable, like to be able to have a profit? So I was able to, so my, my, I had like cash in the bank. I had about $6,000 cash in the bank to like support some of the things that I have to pay cash for. I was able to pay all of that back by month three. All oh, wow. And still pay all of my bills. So I actually haven't pulled a paycheck, but technically I have because I've still been paying on my school loans. So technically I haven't needed to get a loan. I've used credit cards with 0% interest and I should be getting a paycheck 
next month because at this point I opened up in January and I've already got 128 patients signed up to my memberships. That's amazing. Oh, wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. So Martina, you have to mm -hmm. think, um, you know, in the long-term plan, you have to make a long-term plan. You, you cannot plan for three months or six months. You have to think about a year, kind of secure some funds for about six months at least. Usually, um, from the, my experience and from others' experience, it takes about three to four months to start bringing money in. And then by six months, you can pay, you cannot pay yourself all the time, but you can pay every bill that you have, the people that you work with. And then after six months, you're going to see some income coming to you. But every practice is different. So depending on your expectation, depending okay. on the niche that you want to create, and I know as far as I have followed you, I know that you have an interest in fibromyalgia. Yes. You should, you should go on telemedicine with that and you can minimize the cost of your practice by, by yeah. providing telemedicine. That is not going to cost you so much and start with, with part-time. Malpractice will not cost you a lot part-time and um, you know, make some estimated cost in the beginning that's not very hard. We can sit down and I can teach you what you need to figure out. And then, you know, having an idea how much it's going to cost you every month, then you're going to know how much money you have to bring. And you kind of, you know, look at what, what you need to see how many patients you need to pay for that. Okay. And don't expect okay. it's going to, you're going to pay, you know, you're going to have a paycheck in the first six months because I don't think any of us had that. But as long as you can support your practice, um, that's, that's absolutely vital. Now, Celine has a question. And Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you we'll, so much, both of you. I really appreciate we'll, it. We'll answer more, more of your questions. We just have to give the opportunity to everybody to ask questions. Celine. Hi. Um, Hi, Diana. Celine, can you share something about you and you, your transition quickly? Yes, so I'm a rheumatologist in Salt Lake City uh, suburb area in Utah. Uh, I just started my direct specialty care thanks to Dr. Gornita's inspiration uh, <laughs> and she helped me a lot. Uh, and I just started, I, uh, I came out from my employer position last Tuesday, launched my website on Wednesday. I enrolled about 50 patients already. Uh, so it also fifty good patients. Week. Yeah, Do you we remember were... what we talked uh, six months ago when you were asking yeah. how much time it's gonna take you to enroll fifty patients. Yes. So yeah, I was uh, very happy, uh, but I still it's a still cash flow minus. I, I still need some uh, more, but um, you know I was very um, uh, my heart was so warmed by my patient trusting me. And you know, um, uh, believe in this direct care model, uh, and uh, decide to follow me, uh, even though they have to pay the monthly fee. Um, yeah, but my question was, you know, I know that I asked this question multiple times in the Facebook, uh, but I just kind of want to make sure because I always have this uh, concern about HMO, um, HMO uh, insurance companies not honoring the prioritizations from uh, out of network doctors. Um, I know in my state, when I was asking other DPC doctors, uh, there's actually a primary care doctor who had to write Humira because the patient was on the Humira uh, and uh, um, I think from out of state and could not find a rheumatologist for a while. So he used to write it uh, himself. And he told me that uh, he did not have any problem. But um, you know, when I read, that like 70 pages of the policy of that insurance, which is the largest insurance in Utah, they do say that the prioritization of um, specialty medication has to come from in-network doctors. And I remember that in one of the Facebook posting that uh, I think she is an endocrinologist in uh, Philadelphia. Okay, and she, uh, she sent the, um, uh, in the posting that um, she sent in the email to her patients that she cannot take patients who are in HMO because she, she cannot write specialty medications uh, because she cannot do the prioritization. Uh, so I, I want to know, you know, what is your experience 
uh, it's always my back of my head. Uh, I confirmed that uh, one of my patients who went to see me, it's actually she's a new patient, she called that insurance company, asked them, I'm a patient, I want to see this doctor. This doctor says she's out of network. Are you going to pay uh, for my medicine? And she said that they uh, confirmed that they would. And one of the uh, insurance company uh, that, uh, you know, used to contract with my employer before, they actually reached out to me first and asked me to, uh, if I want to extend the contract, and I said, no, I am not taking any insurance. And I asked them, but are you going to uh, uh, honor my prioritization? It's good for you because you don't have to pay the doctor's fee, you know, the patients get, uh, um, are getting taken care of and you don't have to pay me, patient pay me directly. So you can save money by not paying me. You only need to pay for the medication. And they confirmed that they, they would. Uh, so, uh, you know, but in their policy, I know that they said they wouldn't, but they, they said they would. <laughs> so, I, so I don't know if I that- let, I would let Tanya to uh, reply first, and then I'm gonna share my experience. Yeah, so here I have not actually run into that problem and I do have many HMO patients. And so mm -hmm. I haven't actually had that problem yet. Um, and I just continued and, you know, granted a lot of times, like these were patients that I was seeing previously and I did not continue. And I actually did get letters from those insurance companies stating that I was no longer on their, you know, no, no, no longer contracted with them. I will say there are a lot of um, companies here in, in Tennessee that will actually, like they have their own providers <laughs> that like that will all go through, like they'll pay for the prior auth, they'll do all, and it'll actually be under their, their provider, but I will have my recommendation sent to them and that provider will actually send it. And so they end up, it ends up being a win-win. So A, we don't have to do it. B, the patient still gets the medication. <laughs> And, and see somebody else is writing it for me who's actually already in network with them. And so that has been a big thing. Um, even, like, and a lot of times, like the last time we were using this uh, local pharmaceutical company, but they have a nurse practitioner and she writes it and she's on there and, and it's paid for and it's, you know, and they just go by what I say. And so none of my patients have gone without their medications, none of them. I see. So, um... I don't know if that's possible in my state because uh, everybody just get so scared about uh, writing biologics. And actually, even like uh, Skirizy, uh, when I wrote a Skirizy for my psoriatic arthritis patients, the insurance company denied it, saying that it has to come from a dermatologist. So I said, well, did you not know that it's FDA approved <laughs> for psoriatic yeah. arthritis? So I, I said that FDA approval letter and then they approved it. Um, so I don't think that uh, the primary care doctor in our state can write it for me. And I, I know that they will hate it because, you know, how many, you know, the appeal that a denial and they, they have to go through and, uh, you know, um, they're not trained to do that. But, uh, but it's well, good are, that- These are specialty um, companies that actually work specifically with biologics and higher risk medication. So oh. I don't know if that's what you guys have anywhere around you. Like, so we have one that's called, um, Fountain RX or RX, I don't remember. I think it's Fountain RX, but they do biologics. That's what they work with. Biologics from GI, from room, from hematology, oncology, they, and dermatology. They do it all. And so yes, that's there are specialty. some companies that provide insure that provide infusions. They have outpatient, they have contracted outpatient centers and they have their own personnel. And you just send them what you want to infuse. And they take care of everything. Uh, they have oh, staff. And this is only for infusion medication or also for, for infusion, infusion. For infu I know for infusions. Uh, Tonya knows our, about medication. Yeah, our patients, the, our um, specialty infusion services will actually also authorize and pre-auth uh, injectables as well. So you just have to ask and and ask to speak to their uh, representative. Oh, I see. Yeah. Can you can you share that information with me? I, I want to see if we have similar here. Yeah. I, I know the sure. Kroger, Kroger Infusion Center. So now Kroger has an infusion center. I know that they do that, yeah. but uh, we don't have any Kroger infusion in Utah. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, but I yeah I really appreciate. And I also want to ask about um uh, actually uh, uh, mention about the Medicare opt opt out. So I opted out. 
um, you know, um, I waited for about a few days until my employer, because I know that my employer's bill, billing company is so crap, you know. Uh, I finished all my notes like more than 10 days ago, but I just gave, gave them a little bit of time because they're always late in billing, so <laughs> just in case. But I, I waited for five days, and if after five days, you know, if they didn't bill it, it's their problem, it's not my problem. So I opted out. But uh, what I found was very interesting that actually I noticed that uh, I am I was not participating in Medicare. So the, I was very shocked when I first found that found out. And I the the way that I found out was I called the MAC and I told them I want to opt out. How to, how do I do it? And they said, Oh, let me check. And oh, yeah, you are not in par. You are not participating in Medicare. So I said, what do you mean I'm not participating? I mean, you know, I am seeing Medicare patients. And she said, oh, uh, you're only participating through your organization, but as an individual, you're not participating uh, so that if you are out of that organization, the day you sign the affidavit will be the day that you opt out. So you don't have to wait uh, until the uh, first day of every quarter. So which was kind of, uh, uh, I didn't know. And, I, um, and my lawyer who helped me, um, yeah, the legal aspect was uh, Luann, uh, Luann Lees, and she said uh, she, she didn't um, hear about this before, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, if a person uh, of, of the doctor uh, was like fresh, fresh out of graduation and just to be a organ, like a uh, corporate medicine, uh, maybe uh, check with the MAC uh, and, and you can go to PICOS and check uh, if you're non-PAR or participating. And if you're non-PAR and, and make sure that you call them. and basically I call them like three times just in case that the representative I told was mistaken so I called three times just to hear it three times by different people and they all said yeah you are not participating so the day you sign it you don't even have to wait until you receive it uh, the day you sign it uh, that's the day you have opted out so I got the certified uh, mail uh, to confirm that what day I signed in and I sent it in and I started seeing Medicare patient from the next day that's uh, perfect so we will have to, for the sake of time, uh, we would like to thank uh, Tanya for giving us her time and knowledge. And we want to thank everybody that took their time to come here and learn. And I'm very, very happy that I see people growing in this space. And uh, once again, we'll keep going with uh, these webinars. We'll bring more people. Uh, maybe next time is Celine. <laughs> But um, now, thank you so much, Tonya, for all okay. your um, you know, time and advices. And uh, I hope uh, you all have a great night. Thank you.